Welcome to the Sassy Spoon Kitchen. Glad to have you here. Today, we're gonna to be doing a video on sourdough bread. Uh, it's a very simple method, but it takes a couple of days. Now, when I say it takes a couple of days, you're not working and working and working for a couple of days. The actual work only takes a matter of minutes because it's all done in a KitchenAid mixer and uh, refrigerator uh, fermentation, so it's stuck away in the refrigerator most of that time. Very little actual hands-on work. This is the result. Two loaves of beautiful bread. Uh, it does require some equipment, um, which we'll, you'll see in the videos, and I'll list everything you need on the uh, bottom with the recipe. And um, you, all you can do, I do have links to my Amazon site where you can go and buy everything. Or you may have some of this stuff at home already. There's very, there's very little special equipment you really need. But anyway, that's my cat shaking her head. <laughs> Truffle. Anyway, uh, please follow along and watch if you like. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe. We'd love to have subscribers. I usually put out two or three videos a week, sometimes more. So I'd love to have you as a subscriber too. Thanks a lot. Welcome to the Sassy Spoon Kitchen. This is part of our sourdough connection. So the most important thing about sourdough is the starter. And here is ours. It's time to be fed. This bubbly little concoction has risen all the way up to this line and then gone back down to here. So it's feeding time. And as you can see, it's still very happy. It smells really good. It smells like bread. So anyway, um, there are two kinds of whisks you can use with your starter, but this is a dough whisk, and a dough whisk is used for dough, not starter. It's a great whisk when you're making bread, uh, but this really isn't efficient with starter because your starter is very loose in comparison. So save this for making bread. This is what I use with my starter. I think it's just perfect for it. It's small, a really big whisk won't, won't fit very well into your starter jar or container usually. Um, this is a WEC jar that I use. I also use plastic containers sometimes, uh, especially if I'm making one that I'm gonna give away. I also feed my starter with one half cup to one half cup. So this is a half cup um, scoop that I use for the water and then I have another scoop in my bread flour that's a half cup, and I use that for the flour. So the first thing I'm gonna do, oh, first thing I'm gonna do is stir it up. And I just like to give it a good stir before I put anything in it. Get all that stuff from the bottom up. And then I add the water. It's about 95 degrees. You can, there's all kinds of things you can read on how hot or cold to put your water in. That's just my warm setting on my faucet. Um, if you put it in a little warmer than that, that's fine. Uh, you don't want anything over 125 degrees or it might kill the natural yeast in your um, starter. And I have a proofer in my oven so I'm going to be putting this in the proof setting on my oven anyway, so I don't really need warm water. Um, there is a guy that is on YouTube that I love and follow. His name is Food Geek, and he's from Copenhagen. For one thing, he's really cute and fun to watch, but he's very scientific and he does all kinds of experiments on different temperatures of water, different um, timing uh, as far as fermentation and refrigeration and no refrigeration and he's really really great and so I really admonish you to watch him but this is my method after watching him for a long time so this little scoop was my great grandmother's and um, it is about half a cup so that's what I'm going to use 
Now, when I put this in the proofer, in the proof setting, if you notice, it's pretty full. But when I make a loaf of bread or two loaves of bread, that's my recipe is two loaves. Um, it, it actually takes a full container, my recipe. So that is why I do so such a full container. All right, so it's nice and full. Now this will rise all the way up to the top. And in fact, I set this on a dish because it has overflowed the container on occasion. And I don't really like that. So I put it on a dish and if it does overflow, it doesn't overflow into the bottom of my oven because that's quite a mess, even on my steam self-clean to clean up. So I do put a cover on, but not tightly. Normally, if it's out in the kitchen, I don't cover it very much or tightly at all. I usually use cheesecloth because you want the uh, air in your kitchen to uh, the natural bacteria to get to the sourdough. But this is a well-established sourdough and um, there's no real air floating around inside my oven. So I just put it on like that. So that's it. And I actually keep two to three starters going at all times. Uh, for a variety of reasons. I share it a lot and I make crackers and other things, um, flatbreads and um, different things with my discard. Although I don't usually use it at, at discard moments. I usually use it when it's still pretty active. But anyway, I like to have it on hand. And sometimes I toss quite a bit of it. It just depends but I like to watch it and keep it going. And I have one that's mostly rye. And um, rye gives a different flavor to the, the starter. It makes it much more sour, a rye or whole wheat. And even in this one, which is pretty much white, uh, it's all bread flour, but every once in a while, I give it a little bit of, of uh, rye. And that adds to the flavor and development of the starter. And sometimes I will give it half a scoop of rye, or sometimes I'll give it a whole scoop of rye. You'll learn just by practicing and playing around with it. So today, later, actually in about three or four hours, I'll be taking my dough out of the refrigerator. It'll be the 24 hour mark, and um, we'll be playing with that. So I'll see you then. Hey, welcome to the Sassy Spoon Kitchen. So I'm doing a sourdough video for you. And um, this is an all uh, mixer video on making sourdough bread. It's no hands on turning and kneading, except at the very end when we're actually uh, putting the dough into the Bannetons. Um, so, if you don't have a stand mixer, I'll be doing other videos that show you how to do it by hand. And I'm going to show you also how to do a starter um, later in this video. But for right now, our starter is in my oven in the proofing se uh, setting. So we're gonna just skip that part for the moment. And we're going to actually make the dough, which takes several hours actually, but not hands-on. It's really easy. Once you get it weighed out or measured out, if you want to use measuring, um, just every 30 minutes you come and turn on the mixer for a few minutes and let the mixer knead the dough for a few minutes. And then you come back. So it's pretty easy, but uh, it does take time. You have to be home to do it. <laughs> And um, that's pretty much it. So the water is about uh, 94 degrees. Um, it's just lukewarm water. You don't want it too hot. Um, but at this point in the game, it doesn't matter if it's pretty warm because there's no actual yeast or starter in the dough. But that's about my warm tap water. 
setting, so that's pretty much what I use. And um, we're gonna weigh it. I do, if you go down in the directions, I do have directions for the actual measurements if you wanna use measurements instead of weighing. But I do suggest you get a kitchen scale. They're not very expensive. Uh, you can get them for around $20, $25, and they're very beneficial in baking because you get a lot of differences in uh, flour weights. Not so much water, but flour. And um, this is very simple. There's just flour, water, and a little bit of salt. And that's all that's in this. So right now, um, I have my mixer bowl on. We have a, a total of 1,000 grams of flour in this recipe besides the starter, which obviously has flour in it. And in order to start this, we have to tear, which means we put the um, vessel that we're going to fill on the scale and then we push it a second time and that brings it to zero. So whatever we put in the, the vessel, um, that's what we're weighing. If I took this off the vessel, it's 155 grams, which is how much this vessel weighs. So it goes back to zero and we're gonna put in 950 grams of flour. And I'm using um, King Arthur bread flour. And that's quite a lot of flour. Um, this is a real small scoop, but uh, you can watch it go up. It's uh, already at 180 grams. And then I'm gonna put 50 grams of rye flour in. Rye flour will give the bread a better flavor. You can use, if you can't get your hands on rye flour, you can use whole wheat flour. Um, rye flour is pretty hard to find now with all of the um, people using um, gluten-free flours. There's so much, only so much room on the flour. I'm getting low on this. I have a 50 pound bag of flour, so don't worry about me. <laughs> um, there's only so much room. Here I'm at 975, so I'm gonna take a little out. Forty-five, fifty. Uh, there's only so much room on the flour shelves, and apparently rye is unpopular. Uh, I have gone to several stores that normally used to carry rye flour, and they don't carry them. And they have probably thirty flours, um, even in the Bob's Hall Mill section. Um, they have all kinds of other weird flours for gluten-free people. They don't have rye. So I have to order it on Amazon, usually in 10 pound bags. <laughs> so weird. So now I wanna bring this, I, I'm not sure if you can even see it from the camera. It says 950 right now. I wanna bring this up to 1000 because we're adding 50 grams. And again, this recipe is all below the video. It's at 995, so I don't have to add very much more. There's 1000. That's our flour. Then we're gonna weigh the liquid next. All right. Now, the recipe is kind of loose on the liquid because you kind of have to judge um, how much liquid you need by the humidity in the day and that kind of thing. So I'm gonna tear this. Okay, it's at zero. I like to start with 550 grams and then um, go up to 600 if we need it. Five hundred eighty-five. So I will just put it all back in here. Probably more than I, yeah, five hundred. Five forty. Five fifty exactly. 
All right, so I will probably end up putting a little more in. And then once we add my starter, which is a very wet starter, I will probably be putting more flour in after I put the starter in. But for right now, that's where we're gonna be. So I have a dough hook and that's the only um, hook I'm gonna use. First thing I'm gonna do is stir these two flowers together briefly. And we'll put the water in. And we'll see if we need to add more, sorry. If I don't put this on, the flour can make a little bit of a mess. And I'm all for not making messes. I'm gonna scoot this over since I don't need this till I add the salt. I'll turn it off to save the battery. It does have a uh, plug, but I just like it not having, not having to plug it in. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's start over again. <laughs> I didn't even have it up all the way. That's part of the problem. Sorry. <laughs> that was a Julia Child moment. Okay, let's try again. I really do like this little device, but not when it falls all over the place. It just doesn't have anything liquid in there splattering all around. All right, here we go again. So now you can see the dough's collecting all around. What we want it to do is completely come off the sides of the bowl and make, not a whole ball, but make a shaggy dough. And every time we come back, and knead the dough again, it will begin making a ball. So, to increase the speed, it, it incorporates more of the liquid into the dough. You can see that. I still think it needs just a tiny bit more water. Not a lot. We do want a wet dough, it's a high hydration dough, but a lot of that will come when we add the, um, when we actually add the starter. Uh, you can kind of hear it smacking, that's the moisture in there, that's perfect. Okay, that's what we want in the beginning. Now. I'll put my finger down in there. It's very sticky, sticky dough. But that's what we want at the beginning. And we, what we're going to do is let it sit for 30 minutes. And as it sits, the moisture soaks into the flour. And that's exactly what we want it to do. It's a slow process, but that's what we want it to do. So I'm going to set my timer. I'm going to put a towel over it. And we'll be back in 30 minutes. And we'll just let it knead for just a couple minutes. And then we'll just keep coming back every 30 minutes, six times. So I'm only going to repeat it once more, just so you see how, how the dough is developing. And then we'll come back on the last time and you'll see how much it's changed. That is the first addition of water. Now we're going to let it rest for 30 minutes and do a second um, stir and then five more of these. Okay, it's been 30 minutes and we're going to just give it another little whirl. That's it. 
So you do this every 30 minutes, six times. I'm not gonna bore you by doing, showing you the video every six times. On the fifth time, we add the salt, 22 grams of salt. And on the sixth time, we add the starter. So I will show you when we add the starter, which is going to be wet, obviously, and make us even wetter. And we will add about um, half a cup of flour at that point, which will make it a little stiffer. And then we will remove the hook and put the whole bowl into the refrigerator with saran wrap on top of it, plastic wrap. Don't wanna use any brand names there because I'm not using saran wrap. Um, put it in the refrigerator for 24 hours and see what happens. Of course we know it's gonna happen. <laughs> We're gonna take it out 24 hours later and bake it. See you then. Okay, this is our dip and time to mix it up and we are adding 22 grams of salt. You can see it's still really nice wet dough, but let me turn it off a minute. You can see it's um, really come together now. It's not so sticky, even though it is really wet looking. It's um, really nice dough now. So, um, I'm going to add the salt. It's still not making a ball or anything, but it's really a beautiful dough. And uh, we'll put the towel back over it, and the next time we will add our starter. Okay, I think I'm going to add just a little more flour to this. And then I'm going to take It's looking really good. It's a very wet, wet dough. But I'm going to take this and put it in the refrigerator for the night. Looks really good. And I'm going to let it firm up. Okay, welcome to the Sassy Spoon Kitchen. It's time to take our dough and put it in the Benettons. Okay, it's been in the refrigerator for 24 hours, and now we're gonna put it in the Benettons. This is a very cool dough that's been sitting in the refrigerator, and it has expanded a little bit, which is great. So as I'm taking this scraper and going down the sides, it is degassing a little bit, which is just fine. What we want it to do, and this tool that I'm using is actually a clay tool, but you, they also make bread tools like this. And um, I'm just releasing it from the side so it'll come out. And I have a big mess on the side of my bowl. Last night when I was mixing it, I had a big mess. So, that's okay. Now, what I'm going to do is degas it a little further and knead it a little bit. And then, I'm going to cut it in half. And after I cut it in half, we're gonna put it in the Benettons and I'm gonna put it in the oven on proof. I am lucky that I have an oven with a proof setting, but if you don't, that's okay. Oop, I have a little green stuff on my countertop. I made some homemade green goddess dressing a little while ago. And I have some herbs that I thought I got cleaned up but I guess I didn't. Anyway, um, so what I'm gonna do after I degas this, and 
get it kind of meted out. Then we're gonna cut it in half and put each half in a benetton. One half will be slightly larger, not much, because the brown benetton is larger than the, the rectangle one. Only by a tiny bit. So we just want to get all the air bubbles out of this. And it will create some more on its own, which is okay. So it's been in there 24 hours in the refrigerator. And it's nicely fermented. All natural fermentation, which we just love. Us sourdough people love natural fermentation. Okay. It's about degassed. So the reason we have this flour here so that it doesn't stick to the counter too much. Still a really wet dough. Okay. So I'm gonna get it to the point where I can cut it in half now. Still pretty sticky. And I'm gonna cut it mostly in half. One side will be just a little bigger than the other. See that? The side's a little bigger than that one. Um, oops, I'm gonna put a little more on this one. Still very sticky, but good in a sticky way. We don't want it to be. I think maybe. Let me see what you're looking at here. Yeah. I still want just a little more on this one. I don't want the small one to be too small. That's good. Um, when you make the small one too small, it's uncomfortably small. Um, <laughs> silicon's coming out there. You um, end up with a flatter loaf, and you don't want that. Okay. I'm gonna come around on this side. What we're gonna do now is put them in these benettons. And the benettons have been slightly covered with rice flour. And my rice flour is in, in this very finely uh, sieved uh, container. So when I put it in, it barely goes in and then I shake it around and put any excess out. So there's really not a lot of flour in there. Some people put so much in that when they take their loaves out, it's like covered with rice flour. And that's very unattractive in my opinion. I don't like a lot of rice flour on my dough. And the one thing you might want rice flour on your dough on your loaf is. If you're doing an intricate cutting pattern, then you might want some rice flour on there because it shows the pattern better. But otherwise, no, you don't want rice flour on your dough. And really, when I take my loaf out, 
you're going to see most of this flower sticks to the benetton and you don't have much of it sticking to the actual loaf. That's what you want. So, keep that on there. And I use very little rice flour. It, very much of it stays in the benetton. All right, so my first one is gonna be an oval one. And to make the oval one, let me make sure this is showing up for you. So, to make the oval one, you're using a floured surface, but mostly, again, this is a sticky dough. So mostly you're just going round and round like this and um, making an oval. So you're not doing it. The, the round dough is a totally different process, but you're making a sausage shape pretty much and you're pushing it in to the center. Now, when you're actually your bottom shape, <coughs> excuse me, your bottom shape is going into the bottom of the benetton is the smooth side down so this upper top part that's going to be at the top is going to be the bottom when you bake so you're not going to see that um, when you actually bake so when you bake this part the smooth part is going to be on top so see how it's sticking because this is very sticky dough so that's going to be at the top. So I get some of this flour here. And this is going to be the actual part that's going to be on the bottom of the Benetton. And we put it in. So this part up here at the top, it's not so pretty. Don't worry about it because when we turn this out, this part's gonna not gonna show. This is the bottom. Perfect. So we're gonna put saran wrap or wrap over this. It's not saran wrap, it's just plastic wrap. I have a gigantic roll that's this wide and it has thousands of feet on it and I've had it since I lived in Hawaii and I've taken it to South Carolina and North Carolina, it still has thousands of feet on it. So it lasts forever. And um, anyway, so we're gonna put that over it and put it in the oven on proof. Now, if you don't have proof on your oven, don't worry. You can turn your oven on to about 200 degrees, let it get up there and then turn it off and put your oven light on and then let it just sit there and it's almost as good as proof. It will probably be, start cooling off after about 20 minutes and not be quite as good as proofing. And if you have an oven warmer, that also will work pretty well. My oven also has a warmer, but um, this will sit in at the proof setting and be perfect. Okay, the next one is our round Benetton. So I have, still have a little bit of flour here. This is rice flour up here. But anyway, so we're gonna do our round one. And that's really easy. You can do that without any flour actually. So you kind of pinch it like a balloon. Just keep pinching it and pinching it around the top. Yeah, just like that. Just pinch, 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 pinch. So, when you have it all pinched at the top, there's a pesky little piece of the meat. Okay, so here we have the Benetton. There's that. that little piece of mint keeps getting in everywhere. Okay, so what you wanna do is put that perfect side down. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's gonna take all the indentations from the Benetton down. That's why I don't like to use the, the, the um, cloth liners because you get these pretty little indentations from the benetons and i really like them so down we go now we're gonna put the plastic on top put it in the oven and for one hour we're just gonna let them sit in there and they will rise a little bit which is going to be perfect and then we're going to take them out and put them in our dutch ovens on parchment 
and they're going to be preheated to 550 degrees and if you don't have an oven that goes that high that's okay however high your oven goes they're going to rise in those dutch ovens to a perfect beautiful shape so i'll see you then okay we're ready to do the bake here we have the first loaf and we're going to put it onto the parchment. Sometimes I use a um, a uh, pizza This time I'm just using the countertop. Now you can use anything you want as far as, as the uh, surface. I'm just using my countertop here. The lame here is just going to put a cut through here to allow the bread to expand. You can use anything you want. A simple one stripe or you could do a more elaborate cut. I'm just going to do a cut through here and another one down here. Sometimes I do an elaborate wheat. Cut. And that's all I'm going to do here. So once we have this, we are going to bring the um, oval loaf over. Now let me just say that once you, you start using your uh, enameled uh, Dutch ovens, they're going to be ruined by the high heat. So I don't advise you to use your Le Creuset. Use an uh, inexpensive lodge enamel loaf pans or um, even I would use simple uh, lodge cast iron it would even be better but I just had these already and I ruined them already so <laughs> that's the way they are um, and I then would spray with a really good grid sprayer plenty of water in there and that's really good it will help make steam I do have a steam oven, but once you put the lid on, the steam will not penetrate the Dutch oven. So that's ready to go in. My next one is the round one. These are preheated, by the way. I preheated them in the oven at 550. Your oven may not go that hot, but put your oven as hot as it will go. sticky on there that's okay I don't hurt a thing so next we're gonna put this on here these are great by the way these are um, they're they're heat uh, proof up to about I think um, 650 or 700 and um, they're really great um, they're kind of like the of glove and you can get these, I have them on my website, um, which is down below the uh, instructions. I have an Amazon page that you can purchase things on that are, all, it's all um, curated for you. So you can find things that I use on my web page or on, on my recipes. They're all different things. You just go there and find different tools and foods that I use on my recipes. But, um, this is one thing that you can find there. They're really good um, because you have a little more flexibility than you do with an oven mitt. Anyway, they're great. So what you do is hold your hand here. And if you have a pizza um, pan, I'm gonna 
pizza pan. You know what I mean? Our pizza loaf. All right, so if you do that, that you also have a good structure underneath you. But um, on this, I'm going to give this one an ear. So we're going to go out and around like this and out and around like this. Now you can have different um, kinds of razor blades to do this kind of cut. This is a little fancier than some, but whatever you do, you want to make a nice deep cut. And this allows an opening when the red bread rises in the oven and it makes a nice deep cut and it rises beautifully. You can get really fancy with this or you can be really simple with this. This one's very simple. So it goes in and down. That's as simple as it gets. Now we're gonna spray some water in there. And then we're gonna put the lid on. Okay, I'm gonna scoot this back. Both of these in the oven. Okay. They're going to go for 40 minutes. Well, for actually, they're going to go at, for 10 minutes at 550. I'm going to turn it down to 500 for um, 30 minutes. And then they're going to get turned down to 440 with the lids off. So I'm going to put them in now. Sorry about that. I can't see if it's quite on there. Anyway, I'm putting them in the oven now. And they're going in for the time. And then I'll bring them out when I take the lids off. Okay, so I just took the lids off. I sprayed a squirt of water and turned the the uh, temperature down to 440. Now, 20 more minutes of cooking. Yeah. I'll take them and put them on a rack in a minute, and tomorrow morning I'll cut them so you can see the inside. They look pretty good to me. Okay, here's what we've been waiting for. Two days to make and bake these loaves of bread. One of them, I, every time I bake two loaves, I usually give a loaf away to friends. Uh, so this loaf is going to my friend Lauren today, and this loaf is going to stay at my house. So we're going to cut it open and taste it. That's the best part, right? And, you know, when you have a loaf of bread, it's not just for bread. You can make breadcrumbs and croutons. Lots of things. So it is good to have a bread knife with some nice serrated edges because this is a crusty bread and you have to kind of saw through it. Oh, but I can see inside it's going to have a nice crumb, nice chewy texture. There we go. Okay. So there's the inside, and I'm going to cut a little piece. I'm going to cut this in half, because I'm not going to eat a whole piece. And the, this size will fit nicely into the toaster, too. And then I'll cut a piece off of this. 
You can tell that's crusty. <laughs> I make all my own jams. And I usually pick my own berries. And um, so I make my own jams with berries. I pick, I pick blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries. And some other berries too sometimes. We have a lot of berries here in North Carolina. And I go up to my children's house in Alaska and pick their wild berries up there too and bring them home make jam with that so here's the delicious bread with butter and let me just see how it tastes because sourdough needs to taste sour too it's not that good of bread without sour taste mm. yep very good really nice and sour and part of that is because I use rye in my sourdough delicious so i hope you try it and um i hope you don't give up the first two times or three times you make it it doesn't come out looking perfect or whatever just keep trying i had to try many times before i got it the perfect texture perfect amount of holes in it the way i like it now you might not want so many holes in yours or you might want bigger holes I don't like too many holes because to me, when you put something on your bread and it falls through the holes and that's a little too many, but I, this is just right for me. I like just this amount of holes and I love the flavor of sourdough. I grew up in California and I always loved sourdough and um, to me, this is the best flavor for bread. My husband, Wes, he really doesn't like bread for the most part calls it magic bread because he really likes it so anyway give it a try please click like and subscribe i want you to subscribe <laughs> lots more fun videos coming i already have a lot of them made so um if you have any requests of anything you want to make too please send them to me and i um, looking forward to hearing from you soon Bye bye